Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have an assortment of just dogman and paranormal or high strangeness experiences before we jump into it a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? All right, guys, so the first thing that I want to touch on today uh, is throughout the years that I have been researching um, the paranormal and cryptids would be where do these things come from and why do they occur? Now, with Bigfoot, there are lots of different theories. Uh, I remember hearing one theory a long time ago that tied in with ancient Sumerian text, uh, stating that possibly when the draconian or gray aliens landed on this earth they landed either for an expedition or because they started to run out of fuel and knowing that gold is their main source of fuel and knowing that they're not very strong uh physically as we know grays are very small um not too muscular, draconians, a different kind of being, different stature, but they would view themselves as being this almost omnipresent creature, creation, whatever they're flying through, outer space or wherever, even if they're coming from interdimensional. But they're here and they see the primates all of a sudden they then breed genetically not physically but crossbreed genetically their dna with primate dna there is the bigfoot creation for the simple reason to extract gold from uh, mountains and such. Now, that same theory that I heard said quite possibly that may be the reason why humans know gold is valuable right from an early age. Um, not saying that we are creations of that that alien species but early human were forced to extract gold from these mountains and such underground tunnels um that's just one theory that i heard about sasquatch bigfoot and you know it really as you dig deep into 
the alien agenda, the reptilians and such, you start to you start to hear different experiences and it kind of could align, right? But then just recently, um, within the last three years, I had the opportunity of stumbling across this very interesting write-up, which I'm going to share with you right now. And I've shared it before, and I'll probably share it periodically for the rest of this channel's uh, existence, just because... I feel it is that important to have this information out there. So I'm going to share this, then we'll jump into an encounter and something a little bit about the missing 411 that I got to share with you all. Let's get into this very interesting and informative information right now. Normally, when I share this, I don't share the whole thing. I just hit the key points. But I think, I think it's essential that we do hear all of this. And <clears throat> I've said this before. Um, research is helped by, by watching videos because you can pick up on different experiences and piece them together. But some of the best research is by reading different things. And I encourage you all to locate this book because it is probably one of the most informative books that I have read in a very, very long time. Every human culture has believed in the existence of other beings, monstrous, humanoid, sapient, but inhuman. They've gone by different names. Boogeyman, bugbear, cyclops, giant, ogre, one, troll, yeti, bigfoot, dogman, and more. But they were always feared lurkers in the shadows, threats to the clan, tribe, or hearth. Dungeons and Dragons did not create these monsters, and despite ongoing controversies, they do not represent anything modern. Humanity's legendary heroes have been fighting these monsters since time memorial. The real question is why? Why does every civilization have similar myths? Why does every culture have legends of monstrous humanoids? And why are they always depicted as fearsome? And dangerous. Because, my friends, legends are real. Trolls, bugbear, dogman, bigfoot, orcs are real. At least the argument offered by Danny Van Drimini in his book, Them and Us How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Human. Van Drimini is a heterodox thinker and his argument is well outside of the mainstream view. So before we delve into Van Drimini's book, let's discuss what is mainstream view. The mainstream view, archaeologists and geneticists agree that humanity co-evolved and interbred with similar species. We nowadays have an abundant, essentially irrefutable archaeological and genetic evidence Four, the existence of multiple human-like species within the Paleolithic and Neolithic era. These include the Neanderthal, the Denisovian, the Hobbit, and several recently discovered and uncategorized species, such as the Nesher Ramla Homo of Israel. New human species are being discovered daily. In fact, more than likely there is one being discovered right now. Yet, none of these humans or humanoids survive today. Not a single one. All have gone extinct, vanishing save for traces of artifacts and bone in our wilderness and fragments of DNA in our genome. What happened to them all? Here, disagreements begin. The possible cause of extinction, identified by scientists, include extinction, 
from parasites and pathogens, extinction from interbreeding into humanity, extinction from the inability to adapt to climate change, extinction from natural catastrophe, and extinction by war with human. The latter view, it suggests that the human race brutally extinguished the other sapient primates it faced was first proposed by French paleontologist Marceline Boll way back in 1912. It was then promptly ignored for many decades as explained in the Archaeology of Warfare and Mass Violence in Ancient Europe. Archaeologists are increasingly aware that they have underestimated the social impact of collective violence. Sites like Ribmont Castle, Mont Borino, and Calcris confront us in a poignant way with the cruelties of war and mass violence in the late prehistoric and early historic times. There's a growing cliche that archaeology has marginalized violence and presented too pacified of a view in the past. Actually, it wasn't just archaeology that was biased. Academics of all sorts hate violence, and for decades they systematically marginalized it from their explanations of events. Only within the last 20 to 30 years has mainstream academics and scientists accepted the ubiquity of violence in man and its closest kin. Anthropologists systematically underestimated violence of indigenous people, perpetuating the myth of the noble savage. Now they have admitted the level of violence in prehistoric times and non-state societies was much higher than today's. Biologists believe that chimpanzees were the only are only violent because of their interactions with humans. Now they have confirmed that violence is innate to chimpanzees, who routine, routinely engage in war and murder. Historians argued that Indo-European language, culture, and bloodlines spread through migration and trade. Now they've acknowledged it was through large-scale violent conquest. With these developments in mind, mainstream academics have fully begun to accept that human beings drove Neanderthal to extinction through war. Nicholas R. Longrich, a senior lecturer in evolutionary biology and paleontology at the University of Bath, presents an excellent summary of the current consensus. So this is mainstream consensus of to war as human, Neanderthals were very like us. We are remarkably similar in our skull and skeletal anatomy and share 99.7% of our DNA. Behaviorally, Neanderthals were astonishingly like us. The archaeological record confirms Neanderthals' lives were anything but peaceful. Best evidence that Neanderthals not only fought but excelled at war is that they met us and were not immediately overrun. Instead, for around 100,000 years, Neanderthal resisted modern human expansion. For thousands of years, we must have tested their fighters. And for thousands of years, we kept losing. Finally, the stalemate broke and the tide shifted. We don't know why. It's possible the invention of superior ranged weapons, bows, spear throwers, throwing clubs and such let. The lightly built Homo sapiens harassed the stocky Neanderthal from a distance using hit and run tactics. Or perhaps better hunting and gathering techniques let sapiens feed bigger tribes, creating numerical superiority in battle. Ultimately, humans won, but this wasn't because they were less inclined to fight. In the end, we likely just became better at war than they were. Mainstream view, then, is that Neanderthals were behaviorally and physically much like humans, made war much like humans, and were eventually defeated by superior technology and numbers, much as Europeans defeated indigenous peoples throughout the world by superior technology and the numbers. In other words, we killed off Fred Flintstone. Now, the heterodoxal view Danny Van Drimini's. Now let us consider Danny Van Drimini's view. 
Van Trimini agrees with the mainstream that Neanderthals were driven to eventual extinction by war with Homo sapiens. Where he parts ways in the mainstream is in his assessment of what Neanderthals were and were like. Van Drimini states, Neanderthals were an apex predator. Analysis of isotope of bone college has shown that Neanderthals' diet was 90, 97% meat. They were estimated to have eaten 4.1 pounds of fresh meat per day. Ample evidence exists to show that they used or possibly used stone-tipped wooden spears to hunt. From bone littered through their caves, we now know Neanderthals hunted woolly mammoth, giant cave bear, woolly rhino, bison, wolves, and even the cave lion, the most dangerous and lethal animals on earth. Neanderthals were also cannibals. A number of Neanderthal sites reveal bones that have been cut and cracked open to extract marrow. While this hypothesis was initially rejected, a recent find at El Cedron in Spain revealed numerous Neanderthal skeletons with the unmistakable marks of butchery by the cannibal-wielding hand axes, knives, and scrapers. Neanderthals had more robust bones and heavily musculature than a Homo sapien. They weighed 25% more. They were so heavily muscled that their skeletons had to develop an extra thick bones. One of the most one of the most characteristic features of Neanderthal is the exaggerated massiveness of their trunk and limb bone. All of the preserved bones suggest a strength seldom attained by modern humans. Quoting paleoanthropologist Eric Trinkus, a healthy Neanderthal male could lift an average NFL linebacker over his head and throw him through a goalpost. Neanderthals also evolved extremely thick skulls, postcranial hyperrobustity that protected them in close quarter confirmation, confrontation with prey. They all had kyphosis with hunched backs that gave them a distinct profile and gait. Neanderthals' teeth were twice as large as humans, according to 2008 anthropologist research. Their mouths could open much wider than a human mouth, enabling them to take extremely large bites. Judging by the size of the jaw, they had a tremendous bite force. Neanderthals evolved in Ice Age, <clears throat> in Ice Age Europe and had specific adaptations to climate. They had short limbs, large noses, compact torso. Most importantly, they were covered in thick fur. Since no Neanderthal cadaver survives, this point cannot be proven, but Van Drimini points out that every primate except for Homo sapien is covered with fur, and that every cold-adapted mammal during the Ice Age had thick fur, including mammals that were hairless in Africa such as the elephant and rhinoceros. There is no reason to believe Neanderthals were hairless except for our desire for them to look like us. The only way Neanderthals could have survived in the Ice Age without fur was if it had thick protective clothes. Archaeologist Mark White points out Neanderthal clothing would have needed to be more than a ragged loincloth of popular depiction. Some form of tailoring would have been required, but Neanderthal sites have yielded no evidence of needlecraft technology. They were not making clothes because they had fur. Neanderthal skulls had extremely... This is where Van Drimini really blows my mind. Van Drimini, or excuse me, Neanderthal skulls had extremely large eye sockets, suggesting very large eyes. That, in turn, suggested that Neanderthals were nocturnal. However, large eyes poised a problem as Ice Age Europe would have presented Neanderthals with blinding sunlight reflected off the snow. Van Drimini suggested that the Neanderthals had vertically aligned slit pupils, 
which enabled them to use the full diameter of the lens in low light while shutting out bright light by day. Nocturnal primates such as the rheus monkey and owl monkey all have large eyes with vertically aligned slit pupils. Van Drimini suggests Neanderthals also had the tapedum lucidum, much like a cat. That made their eyes shine in the dark, and a dark gorilla like other primates. Now, really quick, this is not the first time I've shared this. I have shared this probably like, I don't know, five times, six times, within the last three years. Because it is such an important piece of information. Neanderthals had distinct facial prognathicism that featured large, broad noses. Van Drimini argues that this suggests a Neanderthal snout with a dog-like nose designed for scent hunting. This was useful during nocturnal raids. Neanderthals didn't speak a human language. He quotes a September 2008 talk presented to the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Their large nasal cavity would have decreased the intelligibility of vowel-like sounds and the combination of a long face, short neck, unequally proportioned vocal tract, and large nose made it highly unlikely for the Neanderthals, and they would have been unable to produce quanta, quantal speech. Neanderthal tongue were also not shaped to speak clearly. Overall, the evidence suggests a creature that spoke with a deep timber and lots of guttural sounds. Neanderthal that Van Drimini describes right here, right here, is what we refer to as a werewolf on this channel. Okay? Van Drimini describes is thus a terrifying creature, a hunched, cannibalistic predator with large, shining eyes, an animalistic snout covered by thick fur, massive muscles built for close combat, hunting by night with a brutish guttural voice, and a huge mouth with sharp, huge teeth and powerful jaws. It did not look like Fred Flintstone. It looked like this. That, my friends, is a orc, bugbear, ogre, dogman, Bigfoot, whatever it is. It's been appearing in our myths and legends for thousands of years. It's the greatest enemy. <clears throat> this is, I usually scan through that bit that I just read and share bits and pieces. And then I stop right there. But then this next part really points out to why when we are children have this ingrained fear of monsters and we already kind of have what they look like. Hairy. Even when we haven't seen a scary movie. They're hairy. They're big. They got sharp teeth and glowing eyes. Why? Because our ancestors thousands of years ago were fighting these things that still exist in small pockets of this of our world. Now, you learn why we fear the night. According to them and us, Neanderthal and human were predator and prey. And we were the prey. <laughs> the Neanderthals came upon helpless humans at night, slown our men, carried off our children and women. How do you think the Neanderthal DNA got into our genome? And they kept doing it, generation after generation. Not only were they stronger, faster, and tougher than Homo sapien, the Neanderthals were just as smart. Under assault by these flesh-eating monsters, the human race nearly went extinct. Only by becoming an apex predator ourselves did we survive. We became the greatest killers the world has ever known, because if we hadn't, we would have died out. Is Van Germany's theory correct? He cites a number of anomalies in the genetic makeup that fossil record of human beings as evidence. 
Let's start with the genetic makeup. The most remarkable thing about the human genome is that it is not very diverse. According to geneticists Pascal Gagnou, humans have by far the least amount of genetic variation of any primate. We actually found that one single group of 55 chimpanzee in West Africa has twice the genetic variability of the humans. He reports another scientist, Bernard Wood, says the amount of genetic variation that has accumulated in humans is just nowhere compatible with the age of our species. To explain it, we must have come within a cigarette paper's thickness of becoming extinct. He says Dr. David Reach of the Harvard Medical School calculated that the population of humans dropped to as few as 50 individuals. Something her- terrible happened to the human race. When did this population bottleneck occur? A number of teams have analyzed mutation rates to find out. The mutation rate and our Y chromosome suggests the bottleneck occurred 30, 37,000 to 49,000 years ago. The mutation rate of a single nucleoidal um, polyomorphous suggests 48,000 years. Dr. Reed's study claims 27 to 53,000 years. Now let's turn to fossils, specifically a collection known as Quefse, 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 Quefse Skulf fossils. Q-A-F-Z-E-H-S-K-H-U-L. Found in present-day Israel, the fossils represent among the earliest known populations of Homo sapiens. The fossils first appeared in the Levant region around 125,000 years ago. After tens of thousands of years occupying Levant, the Quef's skull began to disappear from the fossil record around 80,000 years ago. For the next 30,000 years, that is, from around 80,000 to 50,000 years ago, the fossils in the Levantine region are mostly Neanderthal. After that, the Neanderthal fossils began to disappear from the Levant and Homo sapien fossils began to reappear. The apparent timeline of Neanderthal invasion matches the apparent timeline of our genetic bottleneck. Neanderthals invaded the Levant at around 80,000 years ago and proceeded to drive human race into the brink of doom. The Neanderthal is now gone, but we endure. While we live, he does as well. For we still carry fragments of his DNA, and perhaps we carry the memory of our species' greatest foe in our myths, our legends, or in our Jungian collective unconsciousness. As Bandrimini writes, if early Greek, Roman, Norse, and Chinese mythologies are anything to go by, the legends spun by early humans center around a heroic human, almost always a man who is pitted against an ugly, evil, cruel creature with superhuman strength. This universal mythic monster is usually... Male, inadvertently wild, hairy, dangerous, and uncouth. Often half man, half animal. And tends to live in dank forests, dark caves, and or emerge from the underworld under cover of the darkness. The monster is frequently um, frequent to feed on human flesh, devour children, and stalk the night. So, if that isn't a possible scientific theory on where these creatures came from, um, I've always thought it was weird that as a little kid, 
we have this preconceived view of what these monsters look like, you know. Um, I think every little kid can envision. I mean, if you have like a four year old uh, and they've never seen anything scary. Ask them to draw a monster or something that scares them, a creature that scares them. I don't know. And it'll probably be hairy. It'll be bigger than us. It may have a muzzle. Or or they may draw something that is hairless, but very skinny and pale. I don't know. I've always I've always liked that. Uh, information, that bit of research right there that Van Drimini shares. And I think it's amazing that he does look at the other view. He looks at that mainstream view and he takes from it what he needs, right? He might not agree with it all, but he takes a little bit here and a little bit there. And then he'll talk to a geneticist, a paleo anthropologist, a archaeologist, and take and take and take and combine. And then create this amazing theory. Uh, once again, it's a sci scientific theory with lacking 100% evidence, but it's pretty good if you ask me if not it wouldn't bring up so many questions you know or those aha moments like holy cow how did he how did he describe them they have a hunched back they're cannibalistic they attack humans they have a animal like muzzle designed for hunting at night with glowing eyes. I don't know. What do you guys think? All right. So like many of you all, I have had my share or a few paranormal experiences prior to researching. Um, I have been researching for 30 years since I had my first experience. Um, reading as many books as I could about cryptids, about the unexplained. And then as, as I grew older, I started to put myself in predicaments like going to the conjuring house. Um, going to a haunted asylum here in Saratoga Springs, New York, um, Fort William Henry in Lake George. But what really pushed me was my own experience that I had in 1994. And I know a lot of people, uh, I see different comments and such. What got you started in this? Have you had your own encounter? Yada, yada. And instantly I know that those people are new to the channel. Yes, I had my own experience in 1994. Myself and four friends. Um, I was lucky that we only saw eye shine for a certain amount of time. And then we were in a vehicle when we saw the dog man. One of my friends who was driving us because we were underage, he saw two of them before even getting out of the area where we had our experience, which messed him up a lot. So 1994, we're in a cul-de-sac area, hanging out, and I'm with my girlfriend. My best friend at the time is with his girlfriend. He is Czechoslovakian. 
Um, we are 17, so we cannot drive legally in New York after 9 p.m. It's like midnight. So our buddy Gabe is driving us around, just hanging out. Wicked nice kid, just, you know, I've known him since elementary school. And we're at this cul-de-sac. We're not drinking. We're not smoking weed. We're not doing anything except smoking cigarettes and listening to one of the greatest New York hardcore bands ever, Biohazard. Um, so we're vegging out, just hanging out, listening to music. And this howl, screech, demonic sound comes from the woods, just erupts instantly and I have no idea why the girls yelled this word vampire and I'm like I didn't even look at them to see what they were doing I'm looking at the woods going what are those glowing orbs that are coming at us there's two of them and then two up here and then two there's a set, you know, there's pairs of them. Are those eyes? And then I realized seconds, you know, holy shit, those are eyes. And they're coming at us. And they're at different heights. Some are seven feet. Some are three to four feet. And the woods that we are looking at are... This cul-de-sac is new. So the main street goes right here, Route 9. And this cul-de-sac comes like that, kind of a horseshoe. Now, there were six houses being built, different stages of being built. When they cleaned that road out, they pushed a lot of that debris in the back. So at the time, before I even knew what a dog man was, my whole thinking is... What's in those woods and how is it running so fast through those woods? And I'm at the passenger side of the car. Not, not frozen in fear and not trying to be brave. But confused, trying to figure out what I'm looking at. And... All of a sudden, my friend Martin, with his Czechoslovakian Arnold Schwarzenegger voice, Jif, get in the car, beach. And he kind of shakes me out of it, and I jump in. Well, he jumps in, and I jump in. And the kid had this old kind of like Caprice classic, just this big baby blue land yacht that had bench seats in the front and in the back. Just like this huge bench seat. So Martin's in the middle. I'm in the passenger side. Gabe's driving. The girls are in the back screaming. Ah! And we get to the road. We get to Route 9. And we all look north. Because that's where we need to go. Further into the Adirondacks. Because that's where we live. And uh, it there it is, standing by this wood line by a telephone or by a stop sign, just standing there. And there's a light kind of like across the way, but down a little bit. And Gabe punches it and we're, we're gone. And... Um, I remember that night we were, me and Martin, we dropped the girls off later and we had to go by that area to get the girls home because one of the girls lived in the cul-de-sac above where we had that experience. And so we dropped those girls off at her house. We didn't see it when we went back through. So we knew that Okay, it wasn't just, you know, uh, a telephone pole, some sort of log. 
you know, it was really there and now it's gone. Gabe drops us off, Martin and I, and Martin's house was four houses down from mine. So I get dropped off at Martin's because I'm just like, you know, wound up. And the next day, we go back, Martin and I. And we're looking through the woods and kind of looking and we get this guy yelling at us, get the F out of here. What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we're like, we're looking for his dog. His dog escaped last night. We're looking for paw prints or prints or kind of whatever. <clears throat> and the guy goes, oh, all right. We get a lot of people have been stealing shit from here. So, but yeah, last night while we were closing up, we heard some dogs fighting and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, me and Martin look at each other and we're just like, what the hell? During this time, our friend Gabe blows us off for good, never talks to us again. And, um, hang on, I gotta let my cat out. So, Gabe just blows us off, never talks to us again. He had already graduated. And, um, years later, 20 something years later, I run into him and I'm like, hey, you know, how are you? Yada, yada. I, you know, how you been? This and that. I'm good. And I bring up that night because obviously, you know, it's three years ago, three years ago. So I've got the channel now for four years at that time. And he's like, I blamed you and and Martin for that. And I'm like, you blamed us. We had nothing to do with it. And he's like, well, you know, I saw before, right before the girls yelled vampire and before the howls and whatever that noise was, I saw two huge dog-like creatures walking across the road and where we were parked, so the U goes this way. We were parked like right here. So, you know, the flat areas right here. We're kind of like in the middle of that U. So these things were coming to get behind us because there's still a big patch of woods that are behind us. And... That's what freaked him out. That's why he turned the music down. I didn't realize the music got turned down until, you know, he said it. And then it, I started to think about that night exactly everything. And, and then I was like, why, well, why did you blame us? And he's like, well, you know, you and Martin were listening to, you know, crazy music. And I just thought that was something that you guys did. And, you know, I, he's like, I know that you played with Ouija boards and you listened to, like, you and Martin listen to metal music, like Deicide and Slayer. And and I'm like, dude, I'm like, we didn't have, like, they are, these things are out in every patch of wilderness throughout the country, Gabe. We had no, and it, that bit of information right there is more startling to me than anything I remember. Just knowing that he saw those two cross that road. Then the screaming howl started. And somehow we got out of there alive. I don't know how, but we did. And we are blessed be that we did. Because we could have been a casualty. And there are casualties. Tony Aarons, Amber Miller, Christopher Whiteley, Corey Godsey, Brenda Hamilton, multiple other ones that the government has covered up. 
And I'm going to share this with you. This will be the second to last thing before the end of this upload. But this is a... This is a cover-up and a death by a dog man. Jeff, I've been a subscriber for a few months now. I've been waiting for the right time to share this information with you. This is the third time I've heard you talk about government cover-ups and Tennessee. That's where Amber Miller and Tony Aarons uh, were attacked. So I figure it's as good a time as any. Odds are nothing will change in the near future as far as the government coming clean. Please do not reveal my name or any specifics of our life. If you did, it'd be very easy to figure out the source of this experience and the NDAs that were signed by these rangers and law, for law enforcement officials involved in the case. They are still enforceable. This is a requirement for everyone to keep their jobs. Um, bits and pieces of the... All right, so it's kind of important that I don't share certain, certain things as you, as you can hear. So requirement in order for them to keep their jobs. You see, my husband and I are both born and raised in the area. We're currently living in the area, which is Polk County. Polk County is a large county. However, the Cherokee National Forest makes up almost half of the county's landmass and lays claim to just under 49% of the county. Because of this, the county's population does not reflect its size. In 2021, the population was just over 17,000 with one town bringing in 1,500. Uh, everyone knows everyone, yada, yada. One red light, two gas stations, one grocery mart. The attack occurred in Chilowee Mountain, a.k.a. Benton Mountain. My husband was working on this day, but not on the mountain. He was working elsewhere with the count in the county, but was called to the location as soon as the attack was reported. He arrived on scene within minutes. The following was told to me by my husband, and I can still recall it to this day, almost word for word. When he arrived on the scene, he said there was so much chaos. They were told that a little boy and the mother had been attacked by something, and the little girl was missing. They were told the attacker was a large black creature on two legs, so they immediately assumed it was a black bear, although they were a rarity in the area, and for the most part, black bears do not attack humans unless it's a female with cubs. Even then, the mama bear is more bluster than bluff. More bluster and bluff than actual bite. My husband did not see the little boy nor his mom. They were both airlifted to Chattanooga. While my husband was in his truck getting ready to go, one of the veteran paramedics who worked on search and rescue for another county came over and told my husband that he has treated bear attacks and several of them over his lengthy, lengthy career. But neither of the injuries nor the scene was consistent with any bear attack he had ever seen. He was speaking very low and looking all around while he was speaking to my husband as if he was making sure no one was listening or watching. It was only then that my husband took notice of the people on the scene and he noticed there were several men and women that he had never seen before. He said he just assumed they might be upper tier of the TWRA officials or someone associated with the sheriff's department. After he was ready to go, he picked up his paperwork and camera and walked toward the area of the attacks. After all, it was part of his job. He would have had to file the paperwork on the incident. As he continued toward the area, he noticed that it was taped off. However, he recognized no one securing the area. When one of the men on the outside of the tape noticed he was coming that way, he began walking toward my husband and held up both his hands. He told my husband not to come any closer. My husband started to say something, and the guy told him, this is above your pay grade. When my husband asked what that meant, the man told him to talk to his immediate supervisor, but he could not come any closer, so he turned around and went back to his truck. 
At this time, the Forest Service mainly commuted by radio because cell phones they had would not get reception back in those areas when they were on patrol. He picked up his radio to get in touch with his supervisor, who was supposed to be on his way to the area. At that same time he was attempting to raise his supervisor on the radio, the supervisor called him to tell him to stay clear of the actual scene, as he would not be required to file any paperwork on this case. In all of the years he had worked there, he had never forgotten what happened. He said it was at that minute he realized something seriously something seriously off and that they had already began the cover-up. He just couldn't figure out what they were trying to hide. If, or it didn't take long for him to figure it out. Within the next couple of hours, Suburbans arrived, six men in each one. These men were wearing camouflage, they had weapons, but they were not military. Each local official was basically instructed to search with these men it wasn't until these men arrived that they were permitted to begin the search. They were told they could not begin the search until backup arrived. All four service personnel on the site were armed with a sidearm. They also had shotguns, many of them kept in their truck. My husband had a sidearm at all times and always had his Remington 870 in his work truck. The deputies were also armed. My husband said... All total, there were 12 to 15 armed officers on the scene, yet they were made to wait because someone in the know did not feel this was enough manpower or firepower for one black bear once they began to search. Uh, contrary to what, they were, what was reported by some of the news channels and articles, it took several hours to find the little girl. News reports also said that the bear killed the bear was killed by rangers that same day. Others reports stated it was a second bear which was killed that was responsible for the attack. As far as my husband was aware, no bear or any sign of bear was ever found. After they found the child, he heard two rangers on the radio state that some strange tracks had been found, but they were not consistent with bear. Once these tracks were found, local law enforcement was immediately dismissed at the area. The search was left up to the guys arriving in the sub suburbans. Some other conflicting reports were that the little girl was found 100 yards away from the original site. However, she was not found near the site and it took several hours to find her. Many reports stated there were 60 to 80 volunteers. However, in the area, they felt they might need They felt they might find the little girl with no civilians allowed. I will attempt to link the articles. Once the child's remains were found, uh, what they actually found, what little they actually found, uh, was not rooted to the normal way nor protocol policy. My husband could not find out what they did with what was left of her. That's as far as I will take that. But I will say my husband did not sleep at all. For the next five days, once he could close his eyes, he was unable to sleep over two to three hours a night for the next several months. When he did sleep, he would wake up in a cold sweat, and then he would cry for hours. We'd be in the grocery store or a restaurant or church, or the movies for that matter. Heck, he could have been mowing our grass. No matter what he was doing, I would often catch him just staring off crying. It's like his soul had been broken or crushed. For a couple years, he withdrew himself to the point where he did require therapy. I wasn't sure I would ever get him back. I can say that I can say I, I ever did get I ever did get him back. Who began that shift? April sixteenth, two thousand six. The man was not the man who came back home the next morning, but. After all was said and done, he survived and we survived. He was treated at times like he had committed some crime by the higher-ups. If he was discovered looking into the case, his camera was taken along with his voice recorder. Although he, along with several others, were required to sign a non-disclosure in order to retain employment. At times, we both felt as though 
it was possible our homes, our telephone landlines and cell phones could be being monitored. The clicks and the irritating music. That would increase and decrease during our conversations. We're not subtle or quiet at all. Had it only been my husband who heard these things, I might have said, you're paranoid. But I, along with our oldest son, also heard these things. This went on for a couple years until we all stopped using the landline. We had to keep it as it was a requirement for his job. But one day, thank God, goodness, he finally decided to move on. So goodbye, landline. He currently works as an environmental engineer for a chemical company. He loves his job and is doing very well within the company. I wish I could say everything else worked itself out, but I'm still very adamant to do any solo hiking or walking alone, especially close to dusk. Hmm. So that was the experience that this park ranger's wife sent me. This is the actual news article. Just a warning for those visiting the Smokies. Be careful around bears. Attack by black bear leaves one dead. Six-year-old killed. Two others injured in Polk County, Chilliwee Mountain. Um, one child was killed. Two family members were hospitalized by a black bear. Uh, Thursday afternoon, Chilliwee Mountain in Polk County. According to Cherokee National Forest spokeswoman Nina Barrow. The attack occurred at 4.20 p.m., according to Polk County Dispatcher Jerry Verner. Six-year-old girl had been killed, and her 45-year-old mom and two-year-old brother were mauled by a bear, according to Dan Hicks of Tennessee Wildlife and Resource. So... They suffered a lot of puncture wounds, injuries consistent with a bear attack. The attack took place one and a half miles from the Chilliwee campground. Um, they said the boy was taken a life force helicopter to Thompson Children. The adult was taken to Erlinger Hospital by ambulance. About 50 to 60 people assisted that day. 50 to 60. When... This person said, no, no, there was not that many people. They couldn't allow that many people, which makes a lot of sense because during these, you know, during the investigation of these strange attacks that are blamed on regular animals that are dog man, um, and there are very seldom, like, I would honestly say out of, Let's say there's a hundred attacks in the paper that are weird, but I would honestly say seven to eight of those hundred would be a dog man or a cryptid attack. Um, wild animal attacks outnumber dog man attacks by far. Just when the government starts to lie about the people involved in the case, lie about certain aspects of, you know, like this little girl was found X amount of time later. No, she was actually found here or there and during this period of time. Um, it's all a cover-up. They, they're they lying to us constantly. They, they love to do it. So, just like Amber Miller and Tony Ernst, Brenda Hamilton, that whole town where Brenda Hamilton... Uh, is from Beaumont or Beaumont is still up in arms because the federal government just pretty much shit all over and gave these people no explanation and that's all they wanted was an explanation. Final thing I want to talk about tonight. <clears throat> Missing 411s. Tom Mezik. Um, I am obsessed with the case because it happened in my home area. I live in the Adirondacks. I've grown up in the Adirondacks my entire life. I've camped in them since 
a Cub Scout, you know, and then when our Boy Scout, Boy Scouts kind of dissolved up here, um, I became an Explorer Scout. And I mean, I learned so much in the Adirondacks, but we were always told that not to go outside of the, you know, certain area, especially at our Boy Scout camp, Camp Walk Bomany, um, which was in the mountains of the Adirondacks. Um, there's actually an iron ore mine just down the road from our, our scout camp in a weird cemetery that had graves dating back 200 years um, that we actually, one of our Eagle Scout, one of my friends who was an Eagle Scout for his um, required kind of job to achieve his Eagle Scout, we cleaned that cemetery and actually did a lot of it was beautiful after we got done with it but that, that we had our own creature that we called it was called the hairy h man that was this hairy monstrous humanoid that ran around this boy scout camp all throughout the woods in the road this dirt road to get to our boy scout camp was called hogtown road no no reason why. I guess the town actually had been called Hogtown at one time. I'm not sure. But it was a creepy, creepy place. Anyway, a subscriber had asked me, Jeff, what's the percentage of cryptid involvement in 411? Or they had made like Dogman definitely, Dogman Bigfoot cryptid responsible for 411 100%. No. And I said, no, no. I used to think that myself. I really did. But then I got to thinking about it, and it's not. And then you weigh things. Like, okay, Tom Mezick, old man, 70-something years old, taught survival, was a um, infantryman in the 82nd Airborne Division. Very intelligent, very... Uh, adapted to survival had a gun was hunting had a radio just the other day i did kim crumbo navy seal older man park ranger survivor navy seal i mean regardless of being 70 years old he was still a park ranger he was still active still agile da 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 disappeared without a trace Is there a reason that certain people just disappear without a trace? I'm starting to look into it. And it, there are a percentage of these people who have militarized military skill, military intelligence, military this and that. And I think maybe quite possibly the government is using these portals to send things out and I don't know, mess with certain people. I mean, it doesn't make sense for Tom Mezick to disappear. He was not a rich man. His family, you know, didn't gain anything from him dying. They lost a beautiful man who was loved and loving. But they never found his gun. They never found his walkie, a piece of clothing, just like Kim Crumbo, the Navy SEAL. So is there a connection? I don't know. But I do not think, I'd say maybe 20% of the 100% wides would be cryptid, maybe. Maybe even less than that. But I think something is coming out of these portals and attacking certain people. People that may know a little too much. Things they saw while they were in the military. Who knows? But it makes sense. It makes sense. Are dumbs involved? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. But there doesn't need to be a portal. Or there doesn't need to be a dumb to have a portal. Because these tunnel systems run throughout our freaking country. Just because there's not a dumb here doesn't mean there's a, not a tunnel. 
something maybe is in that tunnel and pops up with this portal bop. Oh, Tom ezek has gone. Kim Grumbo gone. Do, 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 gone. I don't know. I don't know. But there is a connection. And it's not cryptid. Definitely not. With that, guys, I'd like to thank you all for supporting this channel. Your support is honestly what makes this channel continue to grow and go. And honestly, it makes it a place for people to share their experiences, ideas, and theories without ridicule or judgment, just treated with the respect that we all deserve. Um, I hope you enjoyed this upload as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Because I do love doing these uploads in front of the camera and um, sharing different experiences and different ideas. And, you know, with that, you know, stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant. Keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They're out there and they're dangerous. Hell, these scenarios, 411s are real. And they're dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.